The title of this, this homily for May 22nd is From Thyatira to Jerusalem and Beyond. It starts with the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. It describes one of the many mission trips that Paul went on. This is from Acts chapter 16, 9 to 15 in the RSV. During the night, Paul had a vision. Next to the man of Macedonia came with him and said, Come over to Macedonia and help us. He set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace. The following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi. When we had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Thyatira is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, the Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the seventh day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a peasant's play. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira, and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. And she and her whole household were baptized. She urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay in my home. And she prevailed upon us. Then he was the order of a purple dye business, this royal dye that came from the secretion either of the murex snail, typically found along the eastern Mediterranean coast, or the matter root, which grew in abundance in Christian Empire. In ancient Rome, it was only the emperor who could be dressed entirely in purple. When this householder, a widow or possibly just a had heard about the alpha of the Curious, she offered them hospitality while they preached the gospel to her. When she had come to believe, she had been baptized not only her, but her entire household, including slaves, babies, everyone living under her roof in protection. She is considered to be the first known European founder of Christianity. I was being a bit duplicitous when I said they preached the gospel to her. What gospel? None of the canonical gospels was even written by them. Paul died around 62 to 64. The Acts of the Apostles were not yet written by an unknown author until around 70 and 90, by the way, is the gospels are. First work, the earliest, then Matthew and Luke were written from 70 as late as 80 or later. And lastly, the book of Revelation did not emerge until almost the end of the century. It barely made it to the official phenomenon for the Hebrew and Christian Bibles until the end of the fourth century. Then there's the issue of which community even had which texts. The epistles were written out to the whole primitive church as it was growing throughout the empire. It was still taking shape. But either to an individual communities, such as the Galatians or Colossians, or to an individual. The ones not addressed specifically to an individual church were not yet accessible to the entire growing and propagating community. So what do you imagine Paul shared with the living out her household? Some teachings about Jesus, some of his healing and miraculous acts. His last trip to Jerusalem, certainly, the death and resurrection. Yet Paul had not even known this first hand because he was called by the Holy Spirit well after Jesus died. So Paul himself, the great evangelist, was not an eyewitness, but a second generation believer. The formal creeds themselves, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, did not emerge until the fourth century either. But there was something about this enigmatic that enigmatic man Jesus that kept drawing converts from among the known world. Then to cap it off, the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, as it is known to Catholics, did not appear as I normally said 
until the close of the first century. So it was not something even to be considered, which is to follow Jesus and join with a group of couple of believers. The picture that is painted, however, is compelling, haunting, and Right at the time when Christians were beginning to be pro prosecuted for the acceptance of Jesus, to result in arrest, beatings, sentencing, even death. Who would want some vision of the end times, of their end time? So as the persecution decreased in intensity, the belief in the promises of the book of Revelation took root. It is the description following of Jerusalem the city as it is pictured here in Revelation 21 and 22. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light. And its red is the land. All the nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the land of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of, or of lamp or sun. The Lord of God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Those words must have been so heartening to those who were about to be put to death. Hang on. Then this beautiful eternal city, its fruit, rivers, the water, of life, would surely make up for their short time of trouble. And yet, by the middle of the 19th century, the absolute authority and complete infallibility of every word in the ancient text, none of them were original documents, actually, caused a major split not only between denominations, but between individual people. Some still today insist it was all real, every truth, every river. Others like me see it as an allegory, fueled by writers, crying on poetry beautiful words, to give some sort of hope to people who sorely needed them, whose lives, even in their last hours, could hold on to this precious vision in the afterlife. For those of us who no longer hold on to the literal pictures of heaven, what do we have that sustains us? For me, I think of how Lydia did not accept the words about Jesus but for her entire household as well, so that there was an embryonic community of faith right within her own home. Paul himself never traveled alone, but with fellow companions along for the journey. And then finally, a short passage from the words of Jesus during the Last Supper before his death, from John 14. You heard me say to you, I am going away. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you that before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the 
Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. So I have basically deconstructed these scriptures from the other day. I sound that said that for me anyway, the book of Revelation is a beautiful vision of what the world can be. Not a roadmap of a far away after death heaven. And I am certain about it is that Jesus did leave us the Holy Spirit. Not only the comforter, but the encourager, the enlightener. Always leading us into a deeper not just with God, but with one another. I feel that spirit a lot. I've been turning my journal about my daughter's dying from cancer over 20 years ago into a book. The one thing that I wanted to keep after she died was a sense of tenderness. My two older children are already adults, but she at the age of 20 was still living with her father, so she was still pregnant a child. Allowing me to share and tell her this with her that the only ones could no longer receive them without accept. I found a couple of encounters in this type of reading where I was called out of my comfort to be inspired during this time by this spirit to go out beyond my own personal barriers to reach out in a very tender way to strangers. The first one was on Christmas Eve. 1999, the first one after Meg had died of cancer six months before. So as I recorded it, yesterday afternoon I had quite an adventure. As I was leaving the store, I saw a man yelling in the parking lot. I was just going to get into my car and drive away, not knowing what he was yelling about, until I heard what he was shouting, You killed my dog! I walked over them to discover a beautiful little black puppy whose head had been run over by a distracted and hurried shopper who had not even bothered to stop. I knelt down next to a few black orcults, if it was none. I put both my hands on the little one and just started to cry, along with the dog's owner, a total stranger. The puppy's name was Shadow, and the man had been going to get him to his daughter for Christmas. Three more shoppers joined us as we spent the next hour with him on Christmas Eve, helping him to figure out what to do with his dead puppy. Finally, another woman, a total stranger, and I drove him to the nearby town along with his dead puppy so that he could bury him in his friend's backyard and there we left him. On the way home, I shared with the other woman about Meg's death, and she told me about her father's death. The death of a puppy, neither of us had known, had bonded us in this strange instant community of fellow travelers along the sometimes difficult road of life. The second one happened in downtown Port Harris, where I was working, and I was living there at the same time, and I was leaving a bookshop. I saw that a friend had passed by on the sidewalk. He rushed out to say hello. Just as I passed by a woman with a walker, I said, sudden movement behind me. I turned back just in time to see her falling backwards hard onto the pavement. I immediately knelt at her side, joined by another woman on the other side. Her eyes were open, but she didn't respond. I asked someone to call 911. I tried to get a pulse. They put a sweater on her head and loosened her clothing. Someone heard a heartbeat, so I focused on her breath. It was slow at first, then it stopped. I started going over my ancient CPR training in my head. I was about to breathe for her when the breathing started up again, ragged but spontaneous. The other woman said the large prayer out loud. I kept talking to the woman, taking her one out of her pocket so I called her by her name, Marion. When the paramedics finally arrived, the other woman and I stood up by the side holding hands continuing to fall back sacred space. Although the paramedics put in a tool, but to work to an IV and their chest compressions, I knew her spirit had 
and a friend had returned by then, so we went inside the bank grave. A couple of women who were watching the scene from inside were obviously murdered. I talked with them. They shared that they were both conscious survivors, and I talked to them about me. My friend Jenny was still shaken up, so she asked me to say a prayer out loud right there in the bakery. So I did. Over and over again, I'm shown how this life is just a thin veneer over the deep. That life can pass literally in the blinking of time. And somehow felt called by that woman to be there to witness her passing to be present with her. So, a real and accurate description of that written in the book of Revelation, maybe. Maybe not. The manner which Sir Delight followed, it shows us that God always ultimately wins over evil. Communities of peace from all over the world living in harmony. <laughs> It is just that I believe that it is up to us now to be working together with the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit to bring this about, no matter when, no matter how far it extends. Will you listen? Okay.